Hello and welcome to the 39th episode of the Mike McNair Revolutionary Strategy Series. Today is Wednesday the 26th of February 2020 and I'm your host Tom O'Brien. This week's episode is a few days late as I deleted the edited version by accident just before I was due to publish the damn thing. My apologies. Since we finished the book in the previous episode, we now move on to Paul Cockshot's critique of the book. Some of it very good, and some of it very bad. This week I have the new patrons John Hieronymus, Nick Tash, Thrash Goblin, Jeremy Clemens Miro, and Darren Sharp to thank. If you'd like to help keep the good ship Alpha afloat, why not join the Patreon gang gang? From $5 a month, you get two patron only episodes, the right to vote on the reading group series, and other random stuff too. If you don't have any spare dough, just spread the commie word and give me a good iTunes review. The 18th Brumaire reading group series is also starting this Saturday, so why not join us on the live stream over on the YouTube channel? It's at 1 pm EST or 6 pm GMT. Should be a total banger. We have a very full house here today. We have all the way from sunny, warm, tropical Utah, the Varninator, Derek Varn. Hi. Yeah, and we're going to finish up talking about this McNair crap, right? We finished the book last week, Derek, so we're, today we're going to talk a little bit about cock, cock Shots Critique. It's probably the last one. I hope this is the last one. It would make sense if it was the last one. Yeah. Uh, well... We have all the way after surgery to remove her, what's it called, the twins that are born together, conjoined twins. Yes. Lexi has been, has been split, and for medical reasons, Lexi has been uh, moved to a very far away part of the country. Lexi, yeah. how, how was the operation? Uh, the, the operation was a success, Tom. Um, what can I say? I uh, I enjoyed hanging out with Sophie for like two months. It was really amazing. And now I'm in a very, very cold place in the suburban shadow of New York. Have you, uh, do you have to learn to walk again? I got all that in muscle memory. My side, side aches a little bit, but you know, I've, I've, I've lost a few pounds, you know, that's good, right? Yeah. A lot of dead weight. Okay. So hey. next we have. <laughs> hey. <laughs> okay. Hey. Oh, you are going to get into trouble. Uh, Sophie, so I've, I talked to Sophie about the cock shot piece. So even though she's not here, I think I'll be able to represent some of the things she was thinking about. Okay. Then we have all the way in Spain, sunny Spain is Puya in Madrid. How's it going, Puya? Pretty good, Tom. Huh? Pretty good. How does the rain fall mainly on the plane? <laughs> no idea. <laughs> I think so, probably. I mean, well, I think the, city pro- the city probably doesn't take up that much area, so. <laughs> the irony is, I think, like, that it doesn't. The the plain, like, the middle of Spain is actually quite dry and arid. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? I got all the good ones here today. Uh, Kyle, <laughs> how's it going? From all somewhere? right, Tom, all right. Okay. Okay, now, moving on. Derek wasn't here last week, but, Derek, we finished the actual book. Neither was Puya or Kyle, but we finished the last two pages of the book. So today, well, before we started, I wanted to talk a little bit about what we were discussing last week, whereby I don't know if I was, say, making the case for entryism in non-PR countries, but we certainly discussed that about uh, that type of strategy. And I've kind of Mm -hmm. come to the conclusion, listening to myself editing it, that kind of fetishizing this idea of PR, that when you read a book like this that is I think so political based, you know, it talks little of, you know, the, the social element of things. It talks about, you know, the, the high political strategy that you kind of forget about what it is that causes political upheaval to happen. Mm. But in the UK, for example, it wasn't like when the Labour Party came up, it was PR. You know, it was a one first past the post. But what was the cause of the Labour Party coming up was something happening within society. So I know this may seem like a totally obvious point, but it's something I felt like I should 
come out and discuss before we go on is that like yeah. if we to look at the American case, we sometimes see ourselves, you know, the only possible thing that you can do is entryism into the Democratic Party. But really what it needs is something has to come out of society. And, you know, I think that's something that's missing in this book a lot. Well, like, I just want to maybe echo where I think the PR conversation was coming from last time. The reason we were focused on this proportional representation versus first past the post, it's in a way kind of a charitable move to McNair, something maybe protective of his framework to be like, yeah, I guess I could see where this framework would make sense in a political context that isn't like the one that it's written in or the one that most of us, in fact, all of us last round, uh, we're reading it in. So in the United States, in the United Kingdom, this doesn't apply, but maybe it makes sense somewhere else was kind of the conversation we were having. Yeah, it also doesn't make sense in the context of which the historical examples are pulled from. So wh where, where right. does it make sense? What do you mean by that, Derek? It's hard to, like, you know, I, I was actually re-listening to our discussion about this recently um, on Stitcher, believe it or not. You came up in my feed and I heard my own voice. But what I mean by, by this is, like, even when, when, when some of these goals were stated outright as part of the strategy, they couldn't be done in the context in which they were tried in, in the, 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 in the Second International, beginning of Third International. They also can't be done in, in the United States or in... Europe, the proportional representation and and getting past uh, first past the post and alternate voting systems would mitigate some of this, but this is also a world strategy, so no, it doesn't. Right. I, I mean, I, I came away from this book thinking, you know, I I read this book the first two times and thought it was a immediate like it helped me it helped clarify some of my thinking. And when I read it this time and really thought about it in the larger context, I got really I, I get more and more frustrated with it. Like, I find myself agreeing with cockshot on things. I don't ever agree with cockshot on things. Like, it's true. Like, it's just. So, just let me roll you back a little bit, Derek. You say that it didn't work in the context kind of where it was tried. It wasn't true. It wasn't by that. It wasn't tr like, okay. McNair seems to think the reason why Lenin, you know, why the Bolsheviks got all murky in a lot of these, a lot of these, their attempts at republicanism is pretty much because of political decisions. But when, when we kept on talking about this, even in the context of other chapters, it really wasn't just political decisions were why the Bolsheviks were making these decisions. Like there were, there were thousands of other things going on. We went down a rabbit hole about the Germany fetish, went down a right. rabbit hole about, about productive capacities. Went down, I mean, it, it just becomes like, well, how, is, how could you even have gotten to the political question? You never got there. Yeah, like, I agree with you. Like, he doesn't get into that. But, like, what we're talking about, I think, more specifically here is his actual final strategy, not so much his explanation within the book of why previous strategies. But, like, we can still take... I, I still think he would agree from having heard him talking about stuff. I think he does agree that it was a gambit and it didn't work because it wasn't ready and you had to exploit the peasants, blah, blah, blah. And the way you go down the whole Stalinist route. But like, so the, the thing for us is like, is this strategy today a viable one? Not so much like, you know, because it, it was never tried in the second international. This wasn't tried in the second. No, international. Fair enough. Yeah. But it's not. It's, it's a, it's a way of learning from the second international that look, this was the, like, not even this was the elementary error, but this was the fundamental like problem with their whole way of viewing things. Because if you read the book consistently, and you know, I don't think McNair often makes this point specifically, but I think if you really look at the underlying logic, the fatal flaw was the merger with the Lasallians very early on, not at, and that that came to fruition in World War One more than anything. So we're, we're it's basically a, a book that is quote orthodox Marxism quote that says that orthodoxy has always been perverted. So yeah, it's it's pretty important to differentiate that. The strategy being advocated was not tried by Kautsky, was not tried by Lenin, was not tried. Even more so, though, like, see, I don't know if I say that that is that like the orthodox Marxist position wasn't tried because did not Marx and Engels support the SPD day after the merger and what they were doing? Yes, they did. I don't want to use the word orthodoxy in this way, really. Like I was just trying to show how it undermines itself. But more importantly, uh, 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, Engels was full throated. Marx had reservations, but he didn't go, no, this is the wrong way. Don't do that. I'm publishing Critique of the Gartha program now. And Engels was full throated, yet he also wrote Critique of the Offer program, which in some ways is even harsher than Critique of the Goethe program. And the Critique of the Offer program was all done in private letters to Kowski. The, the, the issue, though, is like you can always move the, the fatal flaw back, but eventually you move the fatal flaw back to the entire edifice of Marxism. Like you're going back to the core. But to, to talk about a little bit about the, the strategy of the end of the book, I, like – I, I have found a lot of that strategy to be catch twenty two e. So uh, uh, you you need to do this to change the electoral systems to make it fair to be able to do this. You need to do this to build the workers movement to merge with to do this. But the, Derek, he, he doesn't mention PR in this. That's just us. And I would say that he would make the point that it has to come out of society like the Labour Party came out of society. That the new movement will have to come out of society. This privatization of PR yeah. is something that, that I did. He never I, mentions I, PR in the whole book. I, never mentions I think, it once. I, I, think I, that, I, I, think you're, I think you're still trying to save I think you're still trying to save him from himself. McNair has a virtue in that he recognizes a sort of limited domain of political agency. But on the other hand, this virtue is also a vice because he's he thinks that you need to orient towards the existing left because that's the agency that you have to get together. That's his point of view. He argues for it fairly passionately and logically in uh, debates with, say, Chris Crutrone, who says that the left is dead, and uh, other people that say, we need to just take it to the workers. You know, McNair is pretty clear about saying, no, we need to talk to the left. We need to get our house in order, which, I don't know, he at least delineates between popular agency and, you know, quote, militant agency, you might say. Even if I think he has like the maybe the wrong point of view. I don't know if we should be talking to the left in the way he's saying, but he makes the case much more clearly in other places. But I would say that this is more of a problem than something we just brought in, or even something I've been saying throughout the book that, well, obviously, like, you know, you need the movement out of society. I don't know if we disagree with that, but I think his point is to point to the agency that we have as radical and in intellectuals and as, you know, as Marxists. He has, you know, an article called Go Where the Marxists Are. You know, he's interested in Marxist agency, not necessarily just popular agency. I don't think I'm trying to rescue the theory. I think I've been kind of highly critical in points of it. But, you know, McNair never brings up the point of PR. That's just simple as. True. He, and it's not a problem for Marxists to discuss political strategy. You don't have to bring the fallen fucking rate of profit into your actual political strategy. <laughs> You know, I don't think Marx and Engels, when they were talking about this stuff, were going, oh, yes, but what about the the lades in fucking Manchester when they're talking about political decisions of going this way or that? <laughs> they're linked. I, I think it makes a very clear strategy. I think the difficulty with it is where is this fucking, yeah, the same old thing. Where is this fucking movement coming from? Like, McNair comes out of a milieu of trots. MLs, like you're not saying he's an ML, but you go to the meetings and they have these right, adjacent right. people there. That's his world, you know. But he, he was a burnout from the gay liberation movement. Well, he was a trot burnout first. He was a trot, well, you know, well, before he was ever in the in the gay liberation movement, I think. Is, he is went that, and worked in, so? Yeah, he worked. Oh, I was talking to him. He went and he worked in like a car factory in the 70s. He was doing his degree in Oxford in, I think, history or law. And he left and he went working in like some British auto auto plant. And then he went to East London and he worked in a canning factory using these old 1910 canning machines in the 70s. The they used to be steam powered. That whole strategy, yeah, he did that whole strategy that was big in the 70s that both Maoists and Trotsky did of going back into the shops, which was yeah. an ultimate, it was, that, by the way, was like one of the biggest waste of time, historically speaking, that has ever happened. <laughs> Which is probably why it, it, that, that background actually probably explains the kind of hyper vanguardism of this book, which it is. The reason why it's a hyper vanguardist book is not because like he believes in like a, you know, democratically centralist. I mean, he kind of does, but he defines that differently. Authoritarian party. But it's because he thinks that the intellectuals of the left are what drives the movement. But that's not different than, than what Marx and these boys said. Uh, Marx mm. is no, no, actually it is different than what Marx said. 
Marx actually said that the movement should be led by the advanced parts of the proletariat. He did not speak at all about professional revolutionaries. That talk comes in with Engels. Right. Uh, Luxembourg is pretty good about it identifying like this sense of the vanguard. And even though no one can come up with a co coherent Luxembourgian politics or whatever, like, I don't think that kind of changes that when I say that orthodoxy is perverted in some way, you know, it's that it makes reference to, you know, the heads of Marx and Engels and then distorts something. That's what I'm getting at, Derek. He, he barely mentions the vanguard in the entire book. There's only one point where he it doesn't. You don't. You, you you are reading explicitly. Don't read it explicitly. The reason why he cares about the left is because he cares about the intellectual thought that's going to lead the movement. That is the vanguard position. The fact that he doesn't use that language is a tactic. That's a big claim. Like, oh yeah, it's not like what what the I, hell kind of party is he a part of? I mean, I I I, th I think that just descriptively from what we're talking about here, that you know, I I would ag I would agree with this. Uh, read Derek. Like, I, I, I think that, like, even if you're very charitable towards him, and w the way I try to say it is that he's very interested in the distinct kind of agency that yeah. militants can have, which I think it, that that is healthy as far as that goes. However, at the whole time we've been looking at this book, we have noticed, you know, that, yes, he's got he's thinking about the social in some way, but he's not writing about it. You know, that's not those aren't the relevant variables here. And this strategy doesn't deal with it. We have to pull it out from nothing. It assumes it's already there. I think Lexi and I can speak to this because we started tripping over this when in a political project we were when we were trying to debate, like, well, where does this workers' movement come from that we're gonna merge with? Since you know, <laughs> you know, like where where is this large social support that we can lead? Like it seems like we are like the cart's way before the horse on this. Like when I say vanguardist, I'm not even meaning like that. This is like some kind of elitist. No, I think I think I think um, McNair's virtue is his 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 version of vanguardism is actually inherently democratic, but it's still about the political tactics and the leaderships and the intellectuals who are leading the movement. When he when when he's talking about Bakutinist, you know what he's really talking about? He's talking about tailism, and I realize this because I'm doing mm -hmm. another research project on this like very thing right now. But that's what that's it is. Thing. Tailism, now we use it differently, but originally it meant to be led by the working class instead of leading it. All right. So you were the, you, you get told by the working class and it really comes up in the second internationals because the second, the communist movements can't attract people from the liberal and social democratic ones. So they start blaming the, the workers, the, the second and third. It happens in the second too. Well, the work, you know, so we, we need to leave them because they're going to just, the workers have to maintain their own identity. Like you even hear this in ultra left com, you know, critiques of like worker identity and stuff. The workers have to maintain their own identity. You know, they're not self-abolitionary, which, you know, gets them back in a feedback loop with reformist movements. So we have to get out of front of them and lead them. Now, Marx did actually think something like that, but he thought it was going to be led by the advanced parts of the proletariat who were the most educated, but within the proletariat itself. Tailism actually kind of does the opposite thing. It says that the party apparatchiks and professional revolutionaries should be the ones leading. They have the leisure time to do it. Sorry, I was going to say, like, in the book, he talks about how the party, you know, you will have a division of labor between the party and the, the members, the leader and the members. And the way around this is to have it all mm -hmm. extremely democratic. But like any movement, you're going to have leadership roles if you look at the SPD, it's not a, it's it's not like that they weren't probably full time leaders like Babel and all these guys, you know. Yeah. Like, like. But the so leaders that, are not, the, that's the, the, hardly the, vanguardism in the sense that we know it as in Leninist vanguard, uh, centralized bureaucratic stuff. Well, they, there's a different social background there. There was a you know a really fierce trade union movement happening, and yes, the SPD was involved in building it, but without the workers fighting, it wouldn't have existed. And so th there was. I don't know. It's, it's more believable that in a time like that, if you had representatives and there's a fighting movement, that the movement can keep its representatives in line better. It can quote control the bureaucrats better. Right. The reason why that the, the reason why you can't do this now, and this has been an, an issue with the with the democratic structures of these groups, is the groups are small. There's no mass movement for which they can be accountable to. There's no one to hold them accountable, and there is no strategy in this book to get to that point. 
you already have to be at that point. And so you 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 kind of bulk up the vanguard when I say vanguardism is this, but I've also seen this applied. It just turns into Leninism every single time. But who are they that do this? The, 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 the left. Leninists. Yeah, yeah, but the, left, but the left, but the left, you want to talk about this. This is about the unity of the left, is it not? That is the central point of the strategy, which includes primarily Leninists. But it's it's not about like the, the flaw in like trying this stuff amongst all the existing left is that these these leftists that are LARPing around, uh, imitating fucking Robin Hood from a hundred years ago, they're not anything. They're not a, a new, they're not a new, le they're not a new left. They're not a new movement. They're not the, they're not the intellectuals of the movement. They're people who like fucking putting a, a flag, the Soviet Union up in their bedroom. That's who they yeah. are. That's why you can't say that the strategy is wrong because the, you know, these LARPers who tried it out all end up like rehashing the same bullshit because this is just like we said early on in one of the episodes, it's the latest fad diet for Leninists. <laughs> well, but then, but then you have a left that doesn't exist. Yeah, are, yeah, but that's not what McNair says. You have you 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 have to actually take McNair at his word. What does like, he say? He <laughs> he argues for left unity and the problem of left unity. Not we have to create the left to unify with. Not that we have to create the worker movement to merge with. Those are already assumed to exist. So what you work with is what exists now. I think I think yes. There's the Leninist faction, and those are maybe like some of the loudest on our you know social media pages. But probably, probably like the least. I don't know the least important. I suppose. What else you have is people that are involved with you know literally the DSA and the Democratic Party and that sort of thing. That's probably more of a significant push, and a lot of that comes out of trying to apply McNairist or like a vaguely McNairist strategy, at least this like dirty break kind of thing. Those are people that look at our system, look at this strategy to a degree and say, well, you know, we got to go where the left is, where the Marxists are. And that's in the democratic party. And that's in the DSA. Maybe we can use the DSA as a sort of, you know, proto party, you know, within the Democrats. That also comes from this line of thinking. And I don't know, did I say that, you know, we're more or less important than Leninists, but you also have some like third position, radical flake off sort of left uh, neo cults that see basically now having come through not just Leninism, but a kind of like pro-democracy, pro, oh, let's look at the second international kind of thing, a kind of like, let's recover the, the lessons of this tradition that are, are still kind of like maybe like push towards an autonomous or communizer position and are like resisting. I'm still to some degree trying to recover something from the Marxist political tradition. And maybe this asks more questions than it answers, but I'm not, but I'm not sure. Like, I, I think uh, it's at least given me like this discussion, this like long running discussion about this convinces me that like, these kind of three options of abstention, some attempt at opposition and coalition, eh, those are still like the main options. It's just that it seems like having an independent political agency would be very kind of temporally bounded within a social movement. And that's like maybe a different position than, you know, than is intended by opposition. It's supposed to be a patient long-term position. Okay. I've, I have a question for you, Lexi, Derek, whoever wants to come back, back in on this one. If he had said something along the lines of, in those points, it's, I, I think, what is there, 14? Let's say he puts the 15 point in and says, like Marx and Engels, there's no fucking point in going into these crummy organizations until they become something real and that we shouldn't LARP about and that we should work on our theory and our, our, our whatever instead of doing this LARP-ology, would we all think we would think that the strategy is then good? I would say that the strategy might be good, but it's premature. That we don't, we don't know what the social organizations are enough to, to, to discern what the actual current spectrum would be, and thus where to be within it. Because this does assume a kind of continuity 
with the historical Marxist internationals, that, that, that there's still some kind of continuity there. And maybe there is in Britain, but I highly doubt it. Well, Derek, when I interviewed McNair the first time, I said to McNair, I said, like, I can, I just read Marx in a fucking room. I'm a weirdo. I said, I never went through these organizations. And I'm delighted that I'm like, I kind of think like they should probably all die and something new grow up. What do you make of that? And he laughed and he said, yeah, you're probably right. You know, the only thing he said that was good about the existing ones is that they know how to organize, like they know how to do some stuff, like run meetings and stuff like that. That's like literally what he said. Okay, so so I get, I I guess that I just come away thinking like, and, and maybe when we get into the cock shot, this will make this will make more sense because some of cock shots precise actually resonated with me a bit that because that movement doesn't exist yet, this would end up being kind of oligarchic. And I've seen it because I've also seen it attempted. And you're right, it's because of the LARPers. But I mean, like I'm going to be honest with you, before 1848, Marx was a LARPer. So. Yeah. I mean, he's kind of a weirdo. Like, like, yeah. I mean, he was an academic weirdo. He would have just been a weird Hegelian commentator. We wouldn't have cared. It was that's the, not LARPing though. He wasn't like he wasn't essentially being. He wasn't being a Jacobite and saying, "Oh yeah, everything Jack, you know, fucking they did is correct. Let's be Jacobites." Yeah, that's true. What, what, yeah, what he was being a Jacobin. He's being part of these underground, like you know, revolution. Jacobin, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> The Jacobites, are they the Scottish? Yeah. Scottish, I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. yeah no, but sorry about that. No, no, no. Uh, but he was part of, you know, these sort of like revolutionary radical reading groups, basically. Sort of a left com more than a more than a LARPer. Yeah. Like he, but, he many forms a communist league. But he was know. hanging out with LARPers. Like, let, let's not mince yeah, yeah. Let's not mince words here. He was. And in fact, like what he gets for. Um, yeah. What he gets in trouble for with with the first international is like he he doesn't LARP enough during 1848. Doesn't I mean? And I say it's LARPing; it's an actual war. But they <laughs> they, they never they never stood a chance of winning. So like <laughs> like the factions Marx was with were doomed. Yeah. And you get the kind of feeling that Marx sort of kind of knew it. Engels um, went out there. He had cred. Yeah, Engels yeah. went out there and, read, and had cred, and Bakunin and Wagner went out there and had, got cred. But they use that to attack Marx later. I mean, yeah, they, they, they dunk him. Those mm-hmm. dunks got, you know, like a hundred likes, which is the, <laughs> the the 1840s equivalent of, you know, a million. I think that the Marx thing is is interesting because Marx to me was hanging out with people who wanted to be Jacobins and was smarter than them. <laughs> like, like that's what he's really complaining about half the time is like, you guys aren't the revolutionaries. Like you're, you're, you know, we need, we need these people to actually sign up with, with, with these actual existing social movements. But he was also interested in bringing those social movements about and had reforms designed to bring those social movements about. Those political reforms were reforms? Read the Communist Manifesto, those Tim Panks, those are designed to create the social space, not political space, for the communist movement to emerge. Oh, both, really. Yeah, like, but 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 it, like if you read if you read the Communist Manifesto's actual planks as a way to bring about political the political steps of communism, you're like that just sounds like liberal <laughs> reformism. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but what it's about is social space. And yeah, I mean, Marx changes his opinion on a lot of those too over the you know over the next thirty years. But it's it's it, it's still like Marx is thinking about this not purely in a political way. I mean, even if you look, you know, like you read the Hal Draper book on how he wrote Capital, he starts off right, he wanting to write a theory of the bourgeois everything, including and starting off with the bourgeois state, and he just re- realized that economics was more and more important and harder and harder, and never <laughs> even got to the other se- sectors of society he wanted to write about, because he never got through working through the economic part. But he, you know, he wanted to have a theory of, of revolution, a theory of, th- of state, a theory of all that. He he stated that he just never yeah. did it. But uh, like I've been reading Gary Teeple's Marx Critique of Politics, and mm. like in that, he, I don't know if you read that, Derek. No, I haven't. It's very well worth reading. It's actually okay. a brilliant book. But in that, he makes the case that like Marx, I, th- I think it was like in his critiques that he went through that uh, was a uh, the last one. Let me just check the book. Wasn't the uh, philosophy of oh uh, what's Hegel's one? Uh, the the philosophy of right. Yeah, I think in his final critique, it, it, like Tipa makes the point that he seems to have come to the conclusion that the, he had done enough on the state, and that he had 
that that formulation of what he was going to do was before he actually had finished his study and stuff and that capital was the bomb and that he didn't want to actually go right about the state then because he saw that the state was a secondary function of the underlying economic system and this you know that's why he didn't get into it too much later on he went and worked on other stuff but like that's that's people making the case i think he makes a convincing case for it but anyway i would be fortunate like, because he'd never wrote that book so you know yeah good, i mean but. it would at least explain why he gave up on that because he does i mean like but my point well, is I, like is is but, i just feel like this is putting the, the, like the entire marxist tradition and i want to be fair to back nair on this actually going all the way back to the SP day, maybe putting the cart before the horse, except that when they did it, at least in the early, in the late 19th century, there was a real movement to come out of. And we don't have the same thing. I think we are kind of all agree about that. I think that just because this strategy won't work now doesn't mean that the strategy is wrong. Like strategies only work under certain circumstances, you know, poker or chess. You do it under certain circumstances. The point would be that if there was a social rad a radicalization like the 1940s in America, where there's loads of strikes happening, could something emerge? Would this be a good strategy to apply in that scenario? You know, these these big movements they don't come along every week. They're not always there. Like, and I think this idea of uh, like Marx hanging around with Jack Jacobins and like kind of slagging them off, like that's today's. That's today's Leninists or Maoists or whoever the hell you want to call them, whichever. Take or pick, left comms, blah, blah, blah. They're stuck in a thing that has not worked and failed. And at least McNair is trying to come up with new or rehash and look at history to come up with new <laughs> ideas. Like that's, that, to be honest with you, that's unusual on the goddamn radical left. You know what I think we need? I think we need a little Puya, a little Kyle, and then we can move on to Shaft Blaster. But what about the PR? What about PR? I want to talk about portion representation for an hour. How about that? We talked about that for an hour. <laughs> really? We, it was just a way to be nice, really. Be like, yeah. I mean, because we, we actually have communist parties listening to this in PR countries. And I think they'll probably grok what we're saying there. You know, they'll probably understand that, like, the opportunity that they have as, you know, agents within their electoral structure isn't the same as the opportunities that we have. But we could have easily read some, like one of these Jacobin articles about first past the post that says, actually, it's a good thing. If we can get, you know, a socialist party on the ticket, then there's it's one of the only two options. Great. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know how I feel about that argument. <laughs> I don't believe it. Uh, yeah. like, <laughs> it doesn't sound, sound very good to me. Nice but, to live uh, in that world. Yeah. But yeah, I would, I would agree with Tom that there's no like, you should adapt your strategy for the situation that you're in. There's no just strategy that's useful under every single circumstance. It it seems like the the whole exercise here is extrapolating from a certain political trend in the 20th century, and it reaches some interesting conclusions. But the question of whether that trend or that that pattern is going to be relevant going forward is an open question and the book doesn't really engage with that because it's just trying to say here's the history of the movement here's the history of the parties here's my analysis of politics and uh you end up with this yeah admittedly uh kind of like an extrapolation that doesn't really match the circumstances very well yeah he doesn't he doesn't deal with how like these movements emerged out of the conditions that they were in and that's like a big problem with this book <laughs> Yeah, that's that's true. That's true. It's 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 taken as its assumed knowledge for the audience he was writing for, and that has issues. We want to start in on Cockshot's critique. Should should we do the ass end first because that's where the good stuff is, or should the, we just start off with the uh, with the tanky stuff? I think we have to start with the tanky stuff. He he <laughs> broadly says that he thinks that it's a, a good piece of work and that head towards a kind of a, a Kautskian where you don't go into coalition with bourgeois parties would be a good thing. But then he kind of slags them off about what he says about USSR and China. This is a quote he, he takes from McNair. Under the Soviet-style bureaucratic regimes, there was no objective tendency towards independent self-organization of the working class. Rather, there were periodic episodic explosions but to the extent that the bureaucracy did not succeed in putting a political cap on these, they tended towards a pro-capitalist development. 
the strategic line of a worker revolution against the bureaucracy, whether it was called political revolution, as it was by the orthodox Trotskyists, or social revolution by the state capitalism and bureaucratic collectivism theorists, lacked a material basis. OK, he extends the argument to apply to orthodox Stalinists who have to explain why real Stalinists were not able to organise the opposition to the restoration of capitalism. Does anybody have any idea why the Stalinists weren't able to organise people to oppose the restoration of capitalism? Anybody? Anybody have any ideas out there? <laughs> Well, the, the next thing he says is a little bit, is even kind of more egregious, right? That like, it makes a point that it focuses exclusively on the USSR and, and post-World War II Eastern Europe. That's actually valid. But then it says it ignores China and the Cultural Revolution. And then it goes, okay, so we just made a point. You're being Eurocentric. But also, but if you read J.R. Getty, there was a lot of working class uh, participation in the uh, Great Purges. Isn't this an objective tendency? The great purges are good because they're working class popular. Yeah, that's the argument. Yeah, I don't think he's saying that it's good. I think he's just saying, or like that he's just being Eurocentric. I think he's saying like there was working class, right? You know, it's, there, it's like this is wrong because of this. It, it it's not saying that the great purges and the cultural revolution were necessarily good, but they could be indicative of a positive objective working class tendency within socialism against the bureaucracy and towards some kind of working class power. Which I believe mm. in the case of the Cultural Revolution in the early half, but in the yeah. like for him to take Getty and oh just say God. that the purges have popular support. Getty's argument actually indicates no, it wasn't they weren't essentially organized, but actually it was a lot of it came from mis popular support by mistakes from middling bureaucrats. That's Getty's actual argument. Who is Getty and why do you like roll your eyes when you hear him taking Getty's arguments? Uh, Getty is the is the scholar most interested in documenting the purges, but also saying that they were not purely Stalinist machinations. That, that there was a bunch of objective conditions going on. Some of them have to do with middling bureaucrats making quotas. Some have to do with proper resentment against the bureaucracy. Some have to do with miscommunications and overheating the system for production quotas and needing someone to blame. Okay. Yeah. And so, uh, so Jared Ketty in the Russian historiography is like one of the first people or, you know, like one of the earliest to do what's called like a revisionist read of the Soviet Union and the purges. And he got to go into the archives, you know, and kind of take a look at the narratives that were being put forward by conservative historians like Robert Conquest and, you know, try to see, make heads or tails of how much power Stalin actually had. One mm -hmm. of the sad things about Getty's research, because, you know, Getty doesn't strike me as a tank, even though, a lot of people read him that way. And we had one of his students, Sean, from Sean's Russia blog on Swampside very recently. It's clear that when you look at Getty's research, that the Stalinists are doing a deeply dishonest read of what Getty is trying to do with his research and kind of doing what a lot of people were accusing Getty of. People accused Getty of, you know, by taking some of the agency off of Stalin, who, you know, still when you finish, you know, looking at Getty's stuff, it's clear that Stalin's signature is on everything. You know, like this this guy still had an inordinate amount of authority inside the system. And I don't know, like I think it's still compatible with the idea that maybe he had he had the most concentrated power of any one man in history. But Stalinism was a system. It's not just him. When when Khrushchev, you know, lies about things after Stalin dies, it's not, you know, he lied about how harsh and horrible Stalin was, is that he made a fetish of Stalin in order to defend the whole system. Right. That's that's what Getty's argument is. But what's funny is people turn Getty into Grover Fur. Yeah. If he's like defending the purges as a as like a democratically, you know, popular supportive act against an overly bureaucratic system. And the reason why I'm inclined to, to I like Kyle and Puya's charitable reading of this, but I also know the party that which Cockshot came out of. So mm -hmm. 
uh, it's hard for me to like not know that they supported the purchase and the cultural revolution and, and in a very simplistic way. So th- this swipe here, there's two reads. Like one read is true, I think, that there isn't enough read of the material situation in, in this mm-hmm. Soviet Union. And then there's another read where like, and also the purges and the cultural revolution were kind of democratic and popularly based, so shut up. Is this an objective tendency is the question that Puya and Kyle are kind of get like seeing that Cockshot is trying to answer that, you know, this is its own mode of production. What he's ultimately trying to get at is that class struggle continues under socialism, the old Stalinist line, and that, you know, the purges and the cultural revolution, not merely being the machinations of people at the top trying to destroy all of their rivals, just like any good managerial class, you know, navigator. Okay. Like, (laughs) <laughs> you know, aside from that, the reason that you don't see working class, like what he calls trade union struggle, he doesn't call it, you know, class struggle, really. You know, the reason why you don't see trade union struggle is because class struggle ends up looking like the purges or the cultural revolution. <laughs> right. So like, so what he, he's saying is that like, you know, this kind of idea of working class tendency in it is basically, you know, working class people using this thing to get even, <laughs> you know, that's that's kind of what it sounds yeah. like a lot. Yeah, yeah. 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 Class yeah. People to, get bureaucrats, to get even against socialist yeah. bureaucrats, not capitalists. So, or 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 whoever the fuck, or the woman walking across the street, you turn them down on a date, let's snitch on her, or whatever right. the fuck. Yeah. Oh, and, oh, and like, by the way, it's, it's still it's still what? ended capitalism. So to say that, like, people doing, like, revenge stuff within purges or within other stuff is a sign of some kind of working class movement or anything, it's a joke. It's a goddamn joke. Well, yeah, also, there's all kinds of objective problems this leads to, like, because the second thing he's talking about is since the abolition of private capitalism is bound to remove the old class struggle between labor and capital over profits. Let's get into that for a second. This actually, this sentence is why a certain school of Trotskyists and Marxist humanists and left comms consider, consider the Soviet Union state capitalism is because the, the classes still exist, but labor and capital are no longer struggling over profits because they're collectivized. So th- there's no reason, since there's no struggle over profits, there's no trade union activity. So socialism is bound to, to, to remove class consciousness. But if there's a bureaucratic element of it, that class consciousness is going to be purely revenge. And like, that's the point too. That's like, he's actually trying to draw out the logic there. Yeah, I think he was saying that McNair, he could be reading the situation incorrectly because like McNair is looking for a working class organization. And then Cockshot says, um, yeah, if you get rid of the working class and capital, what's working class participation mean? Yeah, I mean, so you have to basically say that there there was an abolition of... Of class consciousness, although that actually does make point one also kind of contradictory with point two, even though it's justified in point two. Like, but but yeah, this is not this is basically not so subtly Maoist argumentation. That was kind of my read as well. Yeah, I, he may be a Maoist. Like, you may think that these things are great, but like, I don't think he's like making a normative argument. Uh, it's it, well, it's impossible to tell. But, but what I can say is like point one and point two seem to root into each other, but they also contradict each other because if there's working class participation, but there is no working class anymore because there are no profits, then how can there be working class participation in point one if point two is valid? And if point yeah, two, yeah, like, <laughs> yeah, it doesn't make any sense. Like, <laughs> no. they can't be they're not they're mutually exclusive. Like. <laughs> I, I've got something I really want to say about this second one. Like he's saying, basically, uh, imagine like we had a, a communist utopia, okay, and we got rid of classes, and we had a wonderful life, and then these fucking bureaucrats t- decided to to sell us up the river and try and bring us back into capitalism. If it was a brilliant, um, amazing utopian socialist society, do you think? people would have any inkling to fight for it. Seriously. Uh, so from what I understand of, of Cockshot's point of view on this, it, it, he argues that the Soviet population did not support the end of the union and they weren't on board with that. that yeah, that it was basically a capitalist I, I, conspiracy, basically. Yeah. I mean, the Soviet Union is extremely popular in the post-Soviet states. 
but he says even at that time, basically the population of the USSR was outmaneuvered and had their country stolen from them. It's not wrong. Uh, I, I think it actually is wrong. Believe it or not, I think it's I think it's objectively wrong. Like, and I well, also maybe, but like, I think maybe there might be like you know after they actually got it back, they probably regretted it. I don't know, but I don't know what like the time. Like right now, it's a very popular. So, uh, but I don't know. Maybe like right before the end of it, it was not. From what I remember, see, he was relying on polling data prior to the end of the union. Well, to, I've seen to that justify too. that. I've seen that as well. So I, I I don't know if that's just a quirk of the polling data. No, I don't. I don't think. Like I wouldn't think so. I, I, I wouldn't think so either. But you know, I I, I know that the, you know there was like. There was hunger for reform and there was hunger for even market reform, you know, to a degree, you know. But I also don't sure. think the Soviet sure. Union's repopularity was immediate. Like it was, it no. actually took about 10 years for you start seeing that. But I have seen like votes where people like oppose the dissolution. Like I think there was a vote before the dissolution where it was well, unpopular. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. I mean, like, I, I imagine that. I, I don't, I don't think that the Soviet Union was was popularly dissolved. I think the popular unrest that led to this disillusion, however, was was real. You can, like those two things are are actually discrete issues, and the right. argument that cockshot mates have to conflate them. It's also, you know, typical Stalinist defenses line. The the issue that we have now is that capitalism after the after the end was really also problematic. And I'm also going to say like the period of, of nostalgia that people have for the Soviet union, what the, what they want back is not the period anyone fucking remembers. It's like, Stalin. It's, it, it's not, it's not even Stalinism. It's, 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 it's like Brezhnev period seems to be the most popular and like only people in their eighties would remember that. Like it, it's, it's a projection. It's just people know that capitalism sucks. So, uh, well, no, cool. Brezhnev, Brezhnev was 70s. Brezhnev was 70s. You could be 60 and remember Brezhnev. The point here is like, if if it was really something that the people loved, and so maybe the majority didn't want to get rid of it, but if they loved it, if it was a properly communist or socialist society, it would be fundamentally democratic and connected and everything, that it would be easy for them to have actual real social struggle to defend it. And there wasn't real social to struggle to defend it. No, there just wasn't. saying you prefer, just to no. say you prefer one way or the other. That's easy. I could say, oh yeah, I prefer no to have Brexit. To keep it up. And that means something fundamental. It's like, is it Rousseau has some quote about like, excuse the old terminology, but like the savage and would fight for freedom to the death to defend it. You know, the imperialists would say, well, colonizers as well. We could give them a higher standard of living, you know. Rousseau is like, freedom is like fucking so important to them. They're willing to die for the damn thing. Like, and if you had a communist fucking really right. brilliant communist society, it would be so easy to organize an uprising to defend against these bureaucrats. The fact that that didn't happen is a sign that, that there wasn't a, like a, a love of it. They may have thought they preferred here or there, but it wasn't like they were fighting in the Spanish Civil War or the 1917, 18... Civil War. There was none of that, right? And that, rolled over. And, and that's that's why I w- I wasn't just going for the low blow by saying this all collapses into capitalism anyway. That's like relevant, you know. There's there's no like really defensive objective tendency, what have you, as part of the class struggle. You know, there was popular opinion, but in terms of a class struggle, like no, no, people welcomed some kind of change and were hoping that people that said, oh, if you introduce those changes, you'll lose the whole thing. They hoped those people were wrong. <laughs> and well, I know for a fact, because, you know, if you read For a New Socialism by Kaksha and Cottrell, or uh, Sophie has nicknamed him Shaft Blast. If you read that, Kaksha argues Shaft that- Blast. Shaft, Shaft Blast. Shaft Blast. What I'm, is, I'm glad somebody <laughs> appreciates this. I, I, I have no um, idea. That went right over my head. I'm sorry. <laughs> It's okay. I'll I'll tell you when you're older. In uh, For a New Socialism, you know, Cockshot calls the Soviet Union and China examples of Marxian socialism. It's the terminology he uses. But that instead of democracy, you had a cult of personality that that somehow took the place of democracy because that's just a merely political form. I'm talking about the economic form. The economic form was Marxian socialism. And somehow... 
the economic form of Marxian socialism has a hot swappable political seat where you can throw in one man dictatorship or full democracy. It's like that was such a, it was, know, that was so that mm. was so silly of them, wasn't it? Just to put the dictatorship role in, they should have went for the full democracy version. You know, sometimes capitalism goes into like fascism, but it's still you know like the capitalist economy. And, and that's that that a choice. Is that just a simple choice, or is it a material fucking thing? More importantly, mm -hmm. though, capitalism has an alienation between political and economic spheres that that um, would make that you know proper to capitalism. That's fine. Communism, at least on paper, in, in the maybe not in the Marxist sense, but certainly in the Marxian sense of being the communism of Karl Marx, you know, was not just looking for an abolition of the alienation of these spheres because, you know, feudalism arguably is like that too. But in this, you know, higher form communist way that, you know, you can't just make this artificial fetishistic separation between economic life and, you know, political life. These things are deeply intertwined and yeah. to treat them as different like modular options the reintegration of the economic to the to the political is emergent in a social or communal life that's what that fucking means right so, I, like I, th I think this might be a little bit too determined like a little bit i think you're i think you're an engineer and that's a stalinist and we're gonna have to shoot you that's what i think oh my god <laughs> we, we alone we <laughs> alone I mean, like, a little bit, like, I don't think, like, this, like, level of determinism, you know, it's a little bit, like, could go this way, could go that way. But you could see why I would object to it, couldn't you? <laughs> like, considering well, yeah, like, I think there's an argument presented here, and then how important democracy is, you know, in other parts of Cockshot's work, like, it, it seems like, you know, how, how, how could something really be, like, a socialist system and function with either of these things? I guess that's the that's that's the rub. Like, wouldn't you need like a, some kind of fundamentally different kind of institutions than the USSR actually had? Or is was this was the Soviet Union like meaningfully socialist in a way? What does that mean? <laughs> because I don't think you can have socialism without democracy. And I know it's like a canard, but I just don't I don't see how there's meaningful control of the means of production. On this episode, you heard the theme tune, The Order of the Phronic Jesters, and The Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. Thank you for listening, and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, the Marxist podcast and research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit, Jumpsuit Utopia, and Swampside Chats.